Good morning. In just a few minutes, you'll be joining us for worship here at Hope Community United Methodist Church in Pasadena, Texas. You're always invited to come and worship. We have plenty of room for social distancing, and we would enjoy you being with us anytime. Our worship services are at 5.30 on Saturday evenings, and then Sunday mornings at 11. We look forward to seeing you in church soon. God bless you, and keep you well. sing together, my hope is built on nothing less. chapter, uh, beginning with verse 13. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, there would be, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member that there may be no dis dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, we'll all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. All, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all 
teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks God. God. Friends, as you're uh, seated, wow, we're going to sing next. We're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Law. those that are less fortunate than us and that are hurting from all kinds of different reasons nowadays. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious God, we come together humbly, often coming out of chaos and brokenness, remembering that Things haven't always worked out like we wanted them to, and believing that all things do work together for you. We lift up our prayers today, especially for the people in this congregation, those that are not here for whatever reason, those that are here, that have unknown or unspoken needs. Together, we lift up our prayers for them. God, we also lift up our prayers for those who are suffering, those that are in trouble. God, we only need to turn on the news to see the suffering and trouble and trials are all around us. Today, we turn our, our eyes on you and look for answers and ways to restore the kingdom. We pray for the concerns of our local communities, whether it's the policemen and the firemen that are out protecting us even as we meet the street workers and sanitation workers that keep us safe, the mail carriers and all those that are around us in our community that sometimes just go unthought of. And we turn our attention, God, to the world where there's all kinds of conflict, indecision, and fear from countries all over the world, sometimes even in ours. As we pray for the world, we also pray for the world leaders, the people within the communities that surround us for safety and love and mercy and grace. And God, especially in this time where we have fallen down somewhat in our attendance, not just in this church, but everywhere, we pray for the church universal. 
We pray for every church to be filled to the brim, for every church to be making a difference in someone's life, for every church to be effective in offering Christ. We pray for the leaders of those churches, its members, and the mission. And then, God, we know that we stand on the shoulders of all those that went before us. And so today we pray for the communion of saints, those that taught us, instructed us, led us, and got us to this place as we pray the prayer that your son taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we sing this next song, it's called, And Are We Yet Alive? I would ask you to stand while we sing it, if you're able. It's to the same tune, this must be the tie that binds. Many of you will know that. We sing it every year at annual conference as we gather again. It's a reminder that uh, things aren't always what we thought they were. Let us sing together. Just an educational note. Any Charles Wesley hymn, the last verse you always get to heaven. So you always want to sing them all the way to the end. So we get to go. Today I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke. Please remain standing for the reading of the Gospel. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all of the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say that to them, Today this scripture 
has been been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. And you may be seated. So I titled this message Homecoming. It's funny how homecoming means different things to us. I grew up, my dad was from Somerville, Texas, and uh, every year, every graduate of Somerville High School from back when daddy graduated till now, they all went back to town for a big thing for homecoming. I grew up thinking homecoming was always something special. And then daddy graduated from Sam Houston State, so they had homecoming there. And we would go every year up there and he would meet all of the people that he knew, his old professors and all that stuff. And so I grew up with this notion of homecoming. 1983, I moved back to Pasadena and I thought, well, I'm going to get to be a part of Sam Rayburn's homecoming. And I wasn't invited. I went up there to say, I said, well, do we get to like tour the school to go around and meet teachers and stuff? No, we don't do that. I said, well, why do you have homecoming? He said, well, because we sell these big moms and the, and the, the girls get a date and they have a big thing, but it's not for you guys. I'm thinking, well, who's it for? I mean, homecoming, that, that means something special, doesn't it? Homecoming. Last night after worship, Kathy and I went to my uh, ex-sister-in-law's 50th wedding anniversary. She actually celebrated that on December 26th, but it was so Christ Christmas, they put it off a little bit. And uh, I'm sure it's not Kathy's favorite thing to do because, you know, I was in that family for 20 some odd years. And so I go back and, and I'm sitting with these people that were, you know, cousins-in-law and all that stuff. And we have all these memories to talk about and things to remember and stuff. And of course, Kathy wasn't in the picture then and she doesn't know them and she didn't have any part of that. So it's not a homecoming for her at all. And I say all that to think about what it was like for Jesus to go back to the town where he grew up and begin his ministry. Begin his ministry there. He read this scripture, which was the very beginning of his ministry, where he says, he reads from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I'm going to read a little bit further than that today. Somebody then said, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this a kind of strange situation where Joseph and Mary got married and had a baby? Are we sure we want to listen to this guy? It may be one of the reasons that typically in the United Methodist Church, we don't ever get to be a preacher in a town where we grew up. Well, maybe in Houston, but not in the neighborhood. Because there is some reality. There are people that I went to high school with that they look around and they say, you're a preacher? Really? <laughs> we went to school with you. We went with you to places. We skipped school together. We did a lot of stuff together. How can you be a preacher? <laughs> I remember one time I was asked to preach at this outdoor thing over in Deer Park, and they put it on the marquee, Jack Womack preaching tonight. And I'm thinking anybody that I went to school with that drives down San August Street is going to run off the road. <laughs> people can be transformed. We believe that we never give up. And that's why I wanted to include the passage from 1 Corinthians today because it says even the most insignificant or wayward or left out are still created in the image of God and still have value in the body of Christ. And so many times we want to place value on people that look like us, act like us, live in houses like we do, and we don't want to put the same value on those people that may have had a harder time with their life. That's the world we live in today. Where if you've done certain things, you can't rent an apartment. If you've done certain things, you can't drive a car. If you've done certain things, you can't do stuff. And I'm not saying any of that's bad. We need to be careful. There's no question about it. But we also got to believe that Jesus can change people. 
Not that we can. And I think so many times we forget that the church is here as, a, as an avenue, kind of like a, an airport is there for to disperse airplanes to go places. The church is here not to, to save people, but to create a place where the body of Christ can go out into the world and be Jesus Christ for others. What does that look like? Well, sometimes it looks like a plumber or a ditch digger or a guy that picks up trash. Sometimes it looks like a doctor. It might look like radiation or chemotherapy. Whatever the things are that are out there that I think are provided by God's miraculous hand through the wisdom that He gave us to use our... Do you remember what it says? It says, love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and your mind. All of it. And I think we need to remember, if we're going to be the church, and, and, and if there's never been a better time than 2022 for us to be the church in a community that's divided and hurt and broken and mad at each other. We, we, we sang about it in that song, and are we yet alive? We've all had troubles and fears. And if you haven't had, you probably ought to wake up. There's a lot to be afraid of. Turn on the news. I, there's, there's somebody, Houston's because when I was in high school, Houston was the murder capital of the world. We're working on being there again. Crime and violence are all around. People that are innocent not doing anything wrong. Well, maybe that's not true. We don't know what they're doing. They're driving down the road and they get involved in a road rage thing. You know, somebody cuts you off, be kind. It's not worth it. Hand gestures and screaming and hollering, those don't solve anything. But kindness can change the world. Love and mercy and grace are the things that can change the world. I uh, was Kathy and I were watching a, a show the other day. We, we binge watch stuff. So when something's available in 18 episodes, we can sit there and watch it over the next one. And they're really good at making you want to push that button and watch the next one. Kathy looked at me last night and said, it's midnight. Can we stop this? <laughs> I mean, I just want to push the next one. I'd probably stay up all night. When my son gave, years ago, he gave me the series 24 on, on, a, on a CD-ROM set. And I, I spent days watching 24. I was even just became, I'm an addictive personality anyway, but I got into that and I couldn't stop. Because when you get to the end, I want to know what's next. Isn't that really what God is challenging us to be looking at right now? Instead of looking at the past, or looking at even at the reality of a sucky future, I mean a sucky present, to look at a, at a hopeful future. Things can get better. God promises they will get better. But God also gives us some commands in there to make them better, doesn't he? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. These are really simple rules. And they're incredibly difficult to follow. I wrestle with them all the time. My, my thoughts are not always good. I can make a list of things that I wish would change tomorrow. And you know what? They might fix things for 10 minutes, but they wouldn't fix things very long because I'm not smart enough to run the world. Sometimes when we look at what's going on in the kingdom, the kingdom is now, says Jesus. He says, we don't have to wait till we die. The kingdom is now we look out at the kingdom, we think it's in disarray. God, can't you just fix it? And God answers that prayer. He says, what are you doing? What are you doing about it? What are you doing to make a difference in the kingdom? Are you reaching out? Well, yeah, we are. We took some money up to Methodist Children's Home. We're helping out there. We're, we're, uh, we're putting food out in the food pantry. Those are good things that the church as a body can do. But individually, what are we doing? Have we given up? Or can we answer this call that Jesus gives us? Because I'm clear that when Jesus went back to heaven, he said to Peter, on you, I will build my church. Handed him the keys of the church. He said, you're in charge of the church. And that church becomes the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is called to do the same things Jesus talked about right here. If the Spirit of the Lord is within us, then we should proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free. Now, I don't know if you're like me. When I say oppressed, I start to think of people that are, you know, locked up in a corner somewhere. 
Let me tell you, there's people right now in our communities that we all know that are oppressed by their financial situation. If there were not people that were oppressed by finances, these Texas payday loan places wouldn't survive. There are people hurting and they don't know what to do. And, and we've got expertise. We really do. We've got people that know how to balance a checkbook if anybody still uses one. We've got people that know how to look at finances. We know people that know how not to spend more money than they have. We know also there are essential things that you should spend money on. You need to have good housing. You need to have that stuff. But you don't have to have a, a you know, a, somebody said the other day, said we're grabbing about $3 gas while we buy $5 coffee. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, so I, I think we, we need to refocus our efforts. I'm not saying Starbucks is bad. You know, if you can afford it and you want one, they're great. I like them. Somebody gets me one every now and then. Kathy gets one about once a month or so. You know, but, but we also are not in a situation where we're not able to buy food for the next day. And some people need to be prioritized. Many, many years ago, I lived in Beaumont. If you care, 5295 Landry Lane. And I had a couple that lived across the street. He was a uh, delivery sales guy. He had a big Frito-Lay truck parked in his driveway. And uh, they had a hard time. They just really had a hard time. Around the corner from the house was a Jiffy Mart where I always bought gas because it was right around the corner. And I would see Beverly. I would see her over there buying her groceries. She buy breakfast for her little kids in the morning before school at the Jiffy Mart. Well, they bought a new car, and I worked for Ford Motor Company at that time, and she came over to see me, and she said, we've got a problem. We bought this new Ford car, and we can't afford it. Can you help me? And so I called up the guy at Ford Motor Credit that I knew, and they were able to take their car back and voluntarily have it repossessed and end up with a car that they could afford out of the swap. It always pays to have a friend to help you. And then she said, but would you talk to me about how we got in this situation? I said, absolutely. I wanted to help them before, but you can't help people who don't want help, right? And we began to talk market basket in Beaumont is the, is the grocery store, or there was then. And it was like four blocks from our house. Jiffy Mart was a half a block. And I said, Beverly, you got to go to Market Basket to get breakfast and groceries. You got to buy two or three days a week, whatever you can afford ahead. You can't buy a, a honey bun and an orange juice at the Jiffy Mart every day. I said, I, I'm just too cheap to do that. They, yeah, that's fine to get a Coke sometimes when you're traveling, but those places are, are, are convenient and they're expensive. Well, last I heard, they had gotten through their financial trouble. They had sold their house and moved out in the country. A friend of mine was their pastor uh, many, many years later, and they were doing fine. But I had the opportunity to help them with something that was way beyond spiritual stuff. Of course, I wasn't a preacher either. Now, what I'm trying to say is when it says that the body of Christ is included many parts, it means all of the parts. It means everything about us, the, the part of us that can teach, the part of us that can love, the part of us that can care. And if we all had the same talents, we wouldn't be able to survive because we need all the mixed up talents. We need people that are great storytellers and we need people that can't stand up in front of anybody and talk, but they can sure be here to help work or be out in the kingdom doing work. Everybody has a task in the kingdom. Last week, we talked about spiritual gifts, and people always want to know, well, what's my spiritual gift? And, you know, I don't know. But I, I promise you, if you just try some different stuff, when you find that sweet spot in the Spirit, then you'll find that it's a pleasure and a joy to serve, not a task and trouble. So many times we see ourselves as toiling in the vineyard. There's so much work to do in the vineyard and so few workers. We're just working and toiling away. And we even gripe and say, well, you know, 20% of the people have to do 80% of the work. Let me tell you, friends, when you get that spiritual connection, we're no longer toiling in the kingdom, but we're frolicking and having a good time and we're moving forward. And when we do that, then the church becomes the body of Christ, not just for the members, but for those people that are all around. When I came here in 2008, 
Uh, I don't know how many colors the building was. Several. I don't know when they mowed the yard, but it wasn't often. I remember we had a guy named Tomas that mowed. He's a really good guy. And I would call and say, Tomas, when are you going to mow? And he said, well, I don't know. I'll get there in a week or two. I had to tell the trustees. I said, y'all realize we have church on Sunday. It needs to look nice on Sunday. We had pew covers, patch cushions on the first nine pews, but not on the last nine. You know, it's real easy to become focused on how we are doing. Let me tell you, we're having a hard time because everybody's having a hard time. We live in the real world. But we're still making an effort to offer Christ to the people that we don't see here, that we don't know. We got a guy that lives down the street. As far as I know, he's been in the building two or three times, but he's done more for this church than some people that have been here every Sunday. When we got stuff out there, like the other day, we put some of those chairs out that, that were given away that were the old pews, and, and, and uh, he came by and he said, well, these people live in the apartments. I don't know which ones. They have nothing to sit on. Can I take them those chairs? Every part of the body makes it work. The insignificant ones, the marginalized ones, the affluent ones, the really smart ones, and the folks like me. We get together and we make the kingdom come true. And you never know. You never know. A few weeks ago, a guy named Aaron Cooper came back to church here. Aaron grew up across the street. I don't have another word other than hellion for Aaron. He caused a lot of trouble. Not just for me, but for the neighborhood. I took him to camp, made the mistake of giving him my phone number. He went to camp. He called me a few, every few minutes. He didn't like the blanket. He didn't like the bed. They had spiders on the walls, whatever it was. I always figured if Aaron survived at all, he'd be in prison because he was headed that way. Looked up a couple of Saturday nights ago and there was a young man sitting on the back pew dressed properly, clean. After church was over, he came up and said, I'm Aaron, do you remember me? Well, actually, he didn't tell me his name. I wish he would have because I couldn't remember it. But he said, can I go eat with y'all after church? Can I hang out with y'all? Because y'all made such a difference in my life. He said, I know I created a lot of trouble for you. But you didn't give up on me. That's a real life circumstance that happened on this address. But you don't sometimes know. We, if Aaron didn't come back, I wouldn't know where he was. I would just always wonder. We don't always get to see the fruit of our labor. But when we're doing the labor for the kingdom of God, the labor is worthy and worthwhile and worth doing. I was talking to Mr. Lopez up at the school. I said, are we going to get to do mentoring again? He said, I don't think so in the same way we used to do it. COVID has just changed everything. But he said, we're going to try to find a way for you guys that want to come, because this church has a 25-year history of mentoring up there. He said, we're going to try to find a way for you all to do something for the kids that need it and want it. Let me tell you, we, we need to help kids read. If kids don't get out of third grade being able to read at third grade level, they're going to struggle forever. We've got to help them learn to read. We've got to help kids understand boundaries and they got to understand stuff. We've got several generations of kids whose parents didn't attend church, so they don't, when we talk about Jesus, they think it has to do with the little baby at Christmas and they don't know much else. They don't know that, that prayers don't necessarily get your basket full, but they change the prayer. They change the attitude of the prayer. Boy, have I found that to be true. When I can turn my prayer life into prayers for the people that I'm maddest at, things get better for me. I don't have any idea if it gets better for them. Maybe that's what God meant when He said, go into your prayer closet and listen. Pray. Work at being closer. Wesley said it a different way. He said it, he said, uh, attend upon the ordinances of God, which was reading scripture, which is valuable. We should do it. I think we need to do it out loud and in groups. 
so that we get some interpretation from somewhere else because sometimes our own thinking is, as Zig Ziglar would say, a stinking thinking. We tend to look at it and make it about us. I'm not sure it was written specifically to me, but it is about us. He said we need to attend holy conferencing, which is what he would call this. We need to be in a place where we get around other people. We have other thoughts and ideas. He said we need to, to go to communion as often as we can. And he said we need to pray. Sometimes people try to simplify that stuff. Read the Bible's hard. Get one you like to read. Don't worry so much about the version. Get one that you can read and get to. And don't go just pick out little verses. In the men's Bible study, we're doing Proverbs right now. Now, Proverbs is well known for having these little snippets of things that you'd want to remember. One of the challenges of reading Proverbs is to read those little snippets in context of the whole proverb, not just in the place where we want to hear it. The root of all evil is money. That's one of them, I think. But it's in the context of a whole statement. And so we have to struggle and wrestle with trying to figure the Bible out. We've got to try and wrestle and struggle with what God wants us to do. But what I've got to tell you, friends, is begun is half done. I've been doing a lot of reading lately from a guy named Soren Kierkegaard, which is a, he's a philosopher and an old Christian theologian. And one of his statements is that, 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 that failing isn't that bad at all. Not doing stuff is worse than failing. Now, I think so many times we believe we don't know enough about the Bible. We don't know about it. We're not in a good enough place with Christ to offer Christ to others. Friends, make an effort. Because wherever you are is probably light years ahead of the one that you're trying to offer it to. Where you are is good enough. It's sufficient. Because you're a valued part of the body. You may consider yourself as insignificant. You may consider yourself as, as uh, on the edges. You may consider yourself as uninformed. That's all you're thinking. God put you here for a purpose, friends. Use God's purpose in your life. And I promise it'll change your life. It'll make a difference. When you do stuff for God, there's no monetary reward, although sometimes people benefit from it. We may not ever even get to see the fruit on the tree. But when you end your day, knowing I did everything I could for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because He gave everything for me, then your life begins to have purpose like His did. His purpose is everlasting. We're so focused on the short term, sometimes we miss that. <laughs> I have this old friend. He turned 84 a while back. I said, happy birthday. And he said, well, I'm celebrating 83 this year. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm going to go backward every year until I'm in diapers. <laughs> I said, I think you're going to end up in diapers either way. <laughs> you know the reality is life's going to pass and it's going to go on and we're not promised everything but we are promised salvation from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ a free gift given because the price has already been paid I hope somehow we can, can visualize Jesus going to his homecoming and maybe even being rejected but not giving up his worth wasn't defined by what people thought of him. The crowd didn't like him. In fact, joining crowds can be a really negative experience. The crowd stood there and said, crucify him, crucify him. We've got to be that individual that stands up against the crowd. It says, friends, it looks glum and stormy and bad in the world. But we Christians have hope. And when we can include our Baptist and Lutheran and Pentecostal and Catholic brothers and sisters in the body, we have power. Enough power to change the world. I want to read that one more time. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. He said, today the scripture's been fulfilled in your hearing. And I think in modern times to us, he says, and now you've been given the task. What will you do to make this scripture be fulfilled? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, you may have noticed we're not passing an offering plate right now. It's just because of COVID. We have a basket in the back. We gladly accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings there. As you're able, we're going to stand now and sing freely, freely. what love, mercy, and grace really look like. And the Holy Spirit will be with us now as we go into the world. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.